What's good, everybody? I'm the G with a PhD. And you're tuned in to the Green Gorilla Channel. The place where black men can freely express themselves. Straight up. No chaser. What's good, everybody? I'm the G with a PhD, and you're tuned in to the Green Gorilla Channel, a place where black men can express themselves freely, straight up, no chaser. Make sure to hit the subscribe and the like buttons so I can continue to provide you with some real good content. So I want to let all of my viewers know that this video is the second installment of a series of videos that I'm creating uh, that seeks to decipher the thoughts and the principles of the Combahee River Collective. So what we're doing is we're reading their statement and we're outlining their viewpoints so we can understand exactly what it is that they're trying to articulate. Now the Combahee River Collective was a group or a collection of black feminists who had been meeting together in Boston uh, from 1974 to approximately 1980. And the reason that this exercise is important is because this statement is the precursor to intersectional feminism. And one could argue that this particular variant or kind of feminism has begun to permeate uh, Western culture. So there's a need to understand it, to grapple with it, to acknowledge it for being a powerful document as it is, to see if Black men, there are points of contention that we would disagree with them on because these principles are still being used presently. So it's important to understand where they come from and to understand whether or not we are in agreement or in concert with them or that they have struck a chord of disharmony with us. Okay? So there are a variety of topics covered in this statement issued by these women. And uh, the topics are as follows. One, the genesis of contemporary black feminism. Again, I covered that topic in the first installment. So go check it out. The second topic that they discuss is what they believe. And more generally, it is a discussion of their politics. The third topic that they cover is problems in organizing black feminists. And they give a brief her story of their collective. And lastly, and fourthly, they discussed, uh, discuss black feminist issues and practice. So let's just dig into the second section and periodically I'll stop because I'm doing this with you all. I've read the document many times, but it's useful to go over it again and again and again. And this is useful for another purpose, which I forgot to mention, because oftentimes I find black men giving uh, expression of their frustration, but they're not able to point to that which, in principle, they're frustrated with. And I'm an academician by training, and one of the things that you don't want to get into the habit of doing is attacking straw men or straw women or straw persons straw trans persons, whatever the case may be. You don't want to get into the habit 
of attacking that which would, which was not even being made as a point of contention to begin with. That's why this exercise is important. And it's also important because black men need to develop a statement of their own, detailing their own specific issues and their own specific societal injustices that they have to grapple with. And to the extent that we don't do so, we will continue to be stuck like Moses wandering around in the wilderness seeking to find the promised land. So I'm trying to get us on task so that we can develop a statement of our own. But I digress. Let me get into it. Second section, Combahee River Collective statement, what we believe. And they say, I quote, above all else, our politics initially sprang from the shared belief that black women are inherently valuable, that our liberation is a necessity, not as an adjunct to somebody else's, may because of our need as human persons for autonomy. Now, as I look at this sentence and I read it, it's very awkward in structure. But ultimately what they're saying is, as black women, they're inherently valuable. They are inherently valuable. They are endowed with innate dignity and that their liberation is not to be taken as something that is an asterisk on other persons achievement of emancipation or liberty, right? But it's something that is innately imbued with value. And they also say they have a need as human beings to be autonomous, not to be restricted, not to be constrained, not to be censored or censured. I think that's what that sentence is trying to articulate. Then they go on to say, this may seem so obvious as to sound simplistic, but it is apparent that no other ostensibly progressive movement has ever considered our specific oppression as a priority or worked seriously for ending or worked seriously for the ending of that oppression. That's a powerful statement there. No other ostensibly progressive movement, not the civil rights movement, not the black power movement, not the feminist movement, has considered their specific oppression as a priority or worked to end it. And that's what they're claiming. They're claiming that the civil rights movement was a movement in which their considerations were an asterisk, something that existed on the side of the movement that really didn't take their particular concerns into consideration. And then they go on to say, Merely naming the pejorative stereotypes attributed to black women, for example, the mammy, the matriarch, sapphire, whore, bull dagger, let alone cataloging the cruel, often murderous treatment we receive, indicates how little value has been placed upon our lives during four centuries of bondage in the Western Hemisphere. We realize that the only people who care enough about us to work consistently for our liberation are us. Our politics evolve from a healthy love for ourselves, our sisters and our community, which allows us to continue our struggle and work. Now this is uniquely interesting to me. I'm gonna tell you why it's interesting to me. And I haven't really thought about this 
in a thoroughgoing way. Although I have read it, I've never written about it. Although I have read it, when I did read it, I read it from a blue pill, black male feminist perspective. But some of the things that I've gone through in my life have led me to be critical with some of the assumptions made about identity politics and the kind of impact it has on men's lives. Because you can trust and believe. Although the civil rights movement was a successful movement, and I don't think for one minute that during the civil rights movement, black men, this is just my opinion. Now, I may be wrong on this. And if I'm wrong, you can push back against me on this. I don't think that black men in the civil rights movement were trying to attain freedom just for themselves. I don't think they were looking out just for black men. I don't think that black men had it in their minds, we're going to end racial oppression because as black men, we want to free ourselves. The women, okay, that's cool. Hi, Sally Mae. Hi, sister. Sister Becky Sue. Now get in the kitchen and make me some cornbread and muffins. I don't want to sound deprecating here, but I... It just doesn't seem to me as if the civil rights movement was something that was male specific. Although there were men who were figureheads of the movement. I'm not going to go so far as to say that the movement in and of itself was a patriarchal movement. And the participants in the movement consisted of a diverse demographic representative group itself. There were black men, black women, black boys, black girls, and even queer folk who were part of this movement. I'm speaking to James Baldwin. I'm talking about Baird Rustin. I never can get it quite right. I don't know if it's Rustin Baird or Baird Rustin, but you get the picture. But we'll talk about some of the problematics I don't want to get too far off the beaten path here. But so at this particular point, at this section, section two, and in this paragraph, they basically have made the decision that they are going to work on liberation for themselves because nobody else is paying attention to them and their particular and their unique concerns. Let me get back to the text. This focusing upon our own oppression is embodied in the concept of identity politics. Let me read that sentence again. This focusing upon our own oppression is embodied in the concept of identity politics. Now we hear this term thrown around over and over and over and over and over again. But I can most assuredly tell you that identity politics is being used by the Combahee River Collective. They subscribe to it. It is foundational. It is part of their practice of politics. And I don't have a problem with identity politics per se. But I have a problem with people starting with and ending with an identity politics that never ceases. Because, again, one of my ideals, foundational principles that I work with is that the black community is a body politic. And that in order to have a well ordered body politic, you can't. Just look to one demographic, one specific group of persons, and seek to do what is best for that identity group. At some point, somebody has to be able to tie the various interests 
of the members of the black body politic and tie them back together again, or else they will stay fractured on the ground like Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall and took a great fall. And all the king's horses and women and men and trans folks and whoever the hell else can't put the shit back together again. But I digress. This focusing upon our own oppression is embodied in the concept of identity politics. We believe that the most profound and potentially most radical politics come directly out of our own identity, as opposed to working to end somebody else's oppression. In the case of black women, this is a particularly repugnant, dangerous, threatening, and therefore revolutionary concept because it is obvious from looking at all of the political movements that have preceded us that anyone is more worthy than liberation or worthy of liberation than ourselves. Let me read that again, because I kind of jumbled it up, but it's important. In the case of black woman, this is particularly repugnant, dangerous, threatening, and therefore revolutionary concept, or is a particularly, uh, particularly repugnant, dangerous, threatening, and therefore a revolutionary concept, because it is obvious from looking at all the political movements that have preceded us that anyone is more worthy of liberation than ourselves. That's a bold statement right there. That's saying that if anybody deserves to be liberated, it's us. It's us. We're the ones who are pushed to the periphery. We're the ones who are not liberated. We're the ones who have to look after ourselves because nobody else will do it for us. They're going to push us to the, to the peripheries or to the margins. And they're not going to do the work that's necessary in order for us to be able to be liberated, to be autonomous, to be free. And we're going to use identity politics in order to achieve our aims and look after our interests and to center ourselves first. Again. One, let me just say this. I, I can honestly say that if no one is paying attention to you, you do need to do something to get attention. I remember reading a line from uh, Malcolm X's autobiography written by Alex Haley. And, he, and Malcolm said something in there about like a closed mouth not getting fed. Like if you don't make noise, no one is going to pay attention to you and you're going to be passed over. This is what they're expressing here. They're saying, hey, 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 enough of with y'all. What about us? What about us? And the interesting thing about this is that they have been successful. They have been successful. And I think part of the reason that you're going to begin to see pushback from black men is precisely because they have been successful, whereas black men have not. If I, if I had to let the cat out of the bag, I would say this. The black power movements, the civil rights movements, were movements that were based upon race and that sought to ensure that the material well-being of a black collective, whether you agree with the, how co the collective was considered at that time or not, it wasn't something that black men just did for themselves. I think black men did it for the entirety of the black community. That's just my opinion. I could be wrong. I could be fucked up on this. I could be using heteronormative patriarchal ideology in order to express my opinion about this. And then you could use backward looking values and say, look at the patriarchal man and so on and so forth. But I think that that's anachronistic. If you just keep doing backward looking and then you, you critique what people did ahead of time. I mean, you know, 
back in time related to the values and the norms that we practice now, I, I just don't think that's fair to people in the past all the way through and through. But then there are some people who are going to argue against that, but that's a philosophical concept that I don't really want to jump into at the present moment. I just don't want to go there. It's, it's, it'll take too much mental gymnastics to jump through all of those hoops. But I think that by and large, before I get off of uh, topic too much, I think that by and large, this is what happened. The civil rights movement occurred. Black people had the ability to integrate. They had the ability to vote, even though still they were persuaded not to by various tactics. But I think that by and large, immediately after the civil rights movement, you get the feminist movement coming into the fore. And I can tell you with a great dis uh, degree of certitude that the woman's movement for liberation, in particular the second wave of feminism, which is what I'm talking about, has been more successful by leaps and bounds than the black power movements, the civil rights movements at all, period. And ultimately, what my argument is going to be, black women have been able to ride the feminist wave and secure some modicum of success just based upon the momentum of that movement alone. They've been able to use feminist talking points in order to secure advantages for themselves just by being women, because it's the most successful movement in the United States. It is. That's a fact, empirical fact. And you, just, you also have to consider that when white women declared themselves to be a minority group, they were able to use all of the sacrifices that black folks had made as a collective in order to seek and gain advantages for themselves. It ain't no small secret that the main beneficiaries of affirmative action policies are white women. All of that diversity hiring, white women. Now black women are able to, to some degree, participate in the successes of the feminist movement or the women's liberation movement by proxy because they're women, make no mistake. All of that hard fighting and sacrifice, being spit on, having dogs biting you, being hit with billy clubs, all of that has pretty much been phased out or canceled out by means of, women, of the women's liberation movement, which primarily benefits white women. So this is the pushback that you're going to see from black men, even though they may not be able to express it intelligibly. And as you can clearly see, the women in this movement have decided to center themselves, not the community at large. They've decided to center themselves. And one could argue maybe it was a time in which this was necessary because they may have been marginalized and decentered, And we have to come to grips with this. We have to come to grips with it as men. But the question is, is this the case now? Is this the situation now? I'm talking about May 19, 2020. And I don't care who else is listening. I mean, you know, they say you don't need to timestamp your conversations, but right here, right now, this day and age, have they been able to become centered such that the demand for centering themselves and only looking after their own identity group, is that any longer necessary? So let me get back into the text. They say,
they don't want to be put on a pedestal. So here's the direct quote. We reject pedestals, queenhood, and walking 10 paces behind to be recognized as human. Levelly human is enough. That's another very important sentence to look at, to critique, to analyze, because right now I can tell you the norms associated with how men are supposed to behave and what they're supposed to do for and how they're supposed to exist in conjunction with women in general is in flux. Men simply don't know what the fuck to do. Should I wife her? Should I, like, what should I do? Should I smash her and dash her? Like, what, what the fuck am I supposed to be doing here? And right now, we're, uh, we are in a period in which people don't know what norms to operate by. And this creates a great deal of confusion because I can tell you most assuredly that some women, although they accept the general thrust and the gains that they have been able to secure by means of piggybacking on the Combahee River Collective statement, they still want to enjoy the accoutrements that go along with being a woman in the traditional sense of being a woman. But I don't want to go too far off the beaten path. These are just things that I am thinking in real time. They say also, and I quote, we believe that sexual politics under patriarchy is as pervasive in black women's lives as are the politics of race and class. We also find it difficult to separate race from class from sex oppression because in our lives, they are most often experienced simultaneously. We know that there is a such thing as racial sexual oppression, which is neither solely racial nor solely sexual. For example, the history of rape of black women by white men as a weapon of political repression. Now, here's where this becomes important, because this is where the idea of additive notions of oppression comes from. And one has to argue that, theoretically speaking, does this actually work and play out in practice the way that they are theorizing it? Because there are other theories that can be used in order to give a critique of that kind of account of oppression. One such theory that runs in contrast to this one is the one offered by Jim Sedanius and one which Tommy Curry talks about and one which T. Hassan Johnson talks about in their work. And what they try to do is emphasize the fact that Gender oppression, especially patriarchal oppression from white men, is not just something that is oppressive to women, black women, or white women. It's particularly damning to men. Because men are in competition with one another to be at the peak of the hierarchy. Particularly white men. I mean, like, you can see references to this kind of behavior in nature where men fight each other from the ability to mate. So how do they gain their rights? They fucking kill each other. And then they get to be the alpha male of the pack. 
Might this explain some of the violence that you see amongst men directed towards one another? Maybe they're trying to illustrate their sexual fitness, their capacity to be selected as a mate for women. Now, whether you agree with that or not, or whether you think that that's something that men ought to be doing, that's something to take into consideration. But I don't want to move too, too far off the beaten path. Let me get back to it. But before I get back to it, because I can't resist, it should be understood that like women weren't the only demographic rape during slavery or sexually assaulted. This was routine for black men as it was for black women. But we don't, we don't often acknowledge that. We don't often take that into consideration, but we ought to. We ought to. Because maybe our experiences are not as unique as we think they are. And I quote, although we are feminists and lesbians, we feel solidarity with progressive black men and do not advocate the fractionalization that white women who are separatists demand. Our situation as black people necessitates that we have solidarity around the fact of race, which white women, of course, do not need to have with white men unless it is their negative solidarity as racial oppressors. We struggle together with black men against racism while we also struggle with black men about sexism. This is a motherfucking important paragraph right here, man. This is a fucking important paragraph. Although we are feminists and lesbians, we feel solidarity with progressive black men and do not advocate the fractionalization that white women who are separatists demand. So they already understand. And I think this may even, uh, even be lost on contemporary intersectional feminists because many of them feel, I don't have any more tears. I, I did a video about this shit. Black men's tears fall on deaf black women's ears. And in this piece, where I critique what she's saying, she basically says, look, if you don't give me some reciprocity, fuck you. But you see that reflected here as well. It seems almost like they're mutually contradictory viewpoints being put forth. On the one hand, they're looking after themselves and they're advanced, advancing their own interests because only they can do it. But at the same time, they feel like they need to work with black men who are progressive. But then the question becomes, what is a progressive black man? What is a progressive black man? Who gets to define the terms of who is a progressive black man? Are they the ones? Do they get to pick and choose on how they feel? Is it what the people espouse theoretically? Is it the positions that people hold Politically, what the fuck is it that makes a black male progressive, according to this contingency of feminist thinkers? Because what I am beginning to believe is that you cannot, and I, I, I'm not saying this in order to be derogatory towards people who are queer. I'm not. But it seems to me that the only way that you can present yourself as being a progressive related to the people who subscribe to this particular kind of identity politics is you got to be a gay male or a trans woman or you have to agree in totality with everything that they say. You have to be in complete agreement, complete consensus, with their talking points and their view of the world.
But what happens when the very politics that you try to use to help out the cause of women leads to a politics that is self-deprecating, self-abnegating, You say you don't want to be put on a pedestal. Okay, so you're no longer put on a pedestal. I'm talking to you, mano e mano, person to person, since we can't say man to woman or none of, none of that shit. What the fuck do you want me to do? I mean, if I had to use extreme language, I would use the terms that DMX would use. What the fuck you bitches want from a nigga? And if it comes out and it sounds misogynistic or like misogynoir, it's because black men are frustrated as fuck. We're frustrated. Let me move on through it because I'm, I'm starting, it's starting to get lengthy. We realize that the liberation of all oppressed peoples necessitates the destruction of the political economic systems of capitalism and imperialism, as well as patriarchy. We are socialists because we believe that work must be organized for the collective benefit of those who do the work and create the products, not for the profit of the bosses. Material resources must be equally distributed among those who create these resources. We are not convinced, however, that a socialist revolution that is not also a feminist and anti-racist revolution will guarantee our liberation. We have arrived at the necessity, at the necessity for developing an understanding of class relationships that takes into account the specific class position of black women who are generally marginal in the labor force. While at this particular time, some of us are temporarily viewed as doubly desirable tokens at white collar and professional levels. Got that right. You got that right. Some of us are temporarily viewed as doubly desirable tokens at white collar and professional level. You got that right. And they working the shit out of those token jobs. But what's clever about them is that they're working to advance their identity politics and to benefit their constituency. We need to articulate the real class situation of persons who are not merely raceless, sexless workers, but for whom racial and sexual oppression are significant determinants in their working economic lives. Although we are in essential agreement with Marx's theory as it applied to the very specific economic relationships he analyzed, we know that his analysis must be extended further in order for us to understand our specific economic situation as black women. That's a lot to unpack. That's a lot to unpack. So, okay, as black women who are dedicated to undermining class hierarchies, one can argue that they have failed dismally in this regard to meet up to their own principles. Because it seems like to me what has begun to happen, and you can write me if I'm wrong, anybody from anywhere, Come and tell me. Write me if I'm wrong. It seems that identity politics in and of itself has taken a neoliberal turn. They're not on no socialist shit no more. They're on, let me make sure that the black women got these jobs. Let me make sure that the black women are matriculating into these colleges. Let us make sure that we can reserve our pieces so we can get our slices, as many as we can, of the neoliberal pie that's available and out there for us because of the temporarily doubly desirable token jobs that exist out there at the white collar and professional levels. Hmm. 
Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, let me just get back to it. So they also say a political contribution which we feel we have already made is the expansion of the feminist principle that the personal is political. And that's something you're going to see reflected in feminist thinking time and time and time again. That what's personal is political. Now, if I had to unpack it, the idea is that po the political realm was cut off for, 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 uh, from women when they weren't able to engage in the public sphere like men. This is the idea expressed by this. Now, I don't think it really applies to black women at all and black men at all, because neither black men nor black women were able to engage the political inside of the confines of the state. I mean, why else do you why else do you think we were getting holes down and have crosses burned on, on our front steps? And there were bombings and ransackings and shit. Why do you think they had poll and literacy tests? That was all to prevent you from being able to vote or being able to engage the political. So one could argue that this very concept, although it makes sense in the context of white women, it doesn't apply in the same way to black women and their experiences in the political with black men. But let me get back into it. So, a political contribution which we feel we have already made is the expansion of the feminist principle that the personal is political. In our consciousness-raising sessions, for example, we have in many ways gone beyond white women's revelations because we are dealing with the implication of race and class as well as sex. Even our black women's style of talking, testifying in black language about what we have experienced has a resonance that is both cultural and political. There's your black girl magic right there. You know what it is. You've seen it a hundred times. You got daughters and mothers and sisters and, 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 and nieces and cousins. We have spent a great deal of energy delving into the cultural and experiential nature of our oppression out of necessity because none of these matters has ever been looked at before. No one has ever examined the multi-layered texture of black women's lives. An example of this kind of revelation, conceptualization, occurred at a meeting as we discussed the ways in which our early intellectual interests had been attacked by our peers particularly, guess who? Black males. Black males. We discovered that all of us, because we were smart, had also been considered ugly. That is, smart ugly. Smart, ugly, right, crystallized the way in which most of us had been forced to develop our intellects at great cost to our social lives. Now, I don't understand. Like, that just seems like some superficial shit like a motherfucker to me. So you mean to tell me black men was like, oh, we ain't going to listen to you motherfuckers because y'all ugly. Fuck you bitches. Y'all ugly. That's what it was? I mean, that's just the most, there's no substance here. That's just like, just ad hominem shit. Saying that they dismissed you because y'all didn't look a certain way. So black men were that superficial. They didn't have the intellect themselves to contest your ideals. They just said, oh, you some smart, ugly bitches. We not fucking with y'all. Fuck y'all bitches. Y'all just dumb. Oh, y'all y'all smart, but y'all some ugly bitches. That's all that was going on there? Man, I, I just can't believe that that's all that was going on there. But, okay, whatever. 
We discovered that all of us, because we were smart, had also been considered ugly. That is, smart ugly. Smart ugly crystallized the way in which most of us had been forced to develop our intellects at great, at great cost to our social lives. The sanctions in the black and white communities against black women thinkers is comparatively much higher than for white women, particularly ones from the educated middle and upper classes. So in, a, so in other words, black women don't have any recourse. They're marginalized from intellectual conversations. Now, I can say this. You can't say that shit anymore. You cannot say that right now. That might have been the case in 74, but it ain't the case no motherfucking more. It just ain't the case no more. Because right now, they got the mic. You have the fucking microphone. Now just imagine that it's karaoke night and everybody wants to get a turn to enjoy themselves at the karaoke bar, but you got a group of motherfuckers who don't want to let the mic, they got the mic locked down. They got this shit on lock. We got now. We don't care who got next. Ain't going to be no next. I don't want to hear what you got to say. I'm telling you that's how black men feel. That's how we feel. All the while while catching hell and not being able to enjoy any of the advantages that were supposed to come to us in virtue of the fucking civil rights movement. Last paragraph in section two, what we believe. As we have already stated, we reject the stance of lesbian separatism because it is not a viable political analysis or strategy for us. Now, I don't know if you know anything about feminism in its, well, second wave feminism in its nascent stages, like in the early stages of it, but I mean, I mean, let me break it down in real simplistic terms so I don't get all fucking jargony and shit about it. It was a group of white feminists who said, fuck men all together, kill them, fuck them, hate them. They even, they left and went on lesbian communes and shit and was like, fuck my husband, fuck my son, I'll take my daughters with me, but fuck y'all. And you see this kind of attitude reflected in domestic violence shelters, all this shit. Because the very people who were part of that movement now occupy positions in other institutions in our culture and we're not calling that shit out and we're not critiquing it and we don't have any response to it because we don't know the fucking origins of it. So they say that they reject that. We're not moving in that direction. We're not trying to develop lesbian communes to try to destroy the family. But that shit is happening anyway though, isn't it? To them, they say, it leaves out far too much and far too many people, particularly black men, women, and children. A fucking men. But now it's time for y'all to come back together. You got to fuck with us. That's why I keep saying they got to fuck with us. They said they was fucking with us, but now it seems like y'all not fucking with us. And maybe perhaps because the entire movement eschewed the whole concept of socialist politics. And I'm not no big Marxian theorist. But I can see the innate value that, that has to do with there not being a lopsided, inequitable distribution of resources and positions that people can occupy in the culture in which you live. It ain't no strange secret. A long time ago, they had some shit called the Occupy Wall Street movement. And all throughout that movement, they had all of these discussions about the 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%. You don't hear none of that shit now, do you? You don't hear nothing about it now, do you?
But then they go on to say, we have a great deal of criticism and loathing for what men have been socialized to be in this society. What they support, how they act, and how they oppress. That's some strong fucking words there. You have a great deal of loathing? I mean, you could criticize. You, you got loathing for how black men have been socialized? How the fuck have black men been socialized? Particularly since the, uh, since the 60s. Who's been socializing them? Like you hear this recurrent theme over and over and over again from black men who've been raised in this predominantly matriarchal gynocentric culture. It's not patriarchal for us in our community. You can talk that shit about them white dudes, but it, that, that doesn't exist for us right now. And black men are going to say that shit does not exist for us, man. So who's socializing us now? And what are we turning into? And where can we turn to? Where's our fucking support? We just wandering around out here trying to figure this shit out. Like I said, Moses in the fucking wilderness looking for the promised land. And then you got a group of people saying they are loathing of how we've been socialized. Now, I'm not going to say that there aren't some regressive elements in our culture, like there's not a lot of homophobia and there's not some sexism out here. There is. But I think the things have gotten by and large better than what they have been like. I don't know any man that's going to say, get, bitch, get your ass in that kitchen and make me a fucking sandwich before I slap the shit out of your ass. I don't know any men like that. We're trying to use the threat of violence as a way to control somebody's behavior. We have to start reordering and rethinking some of these dynamics as they play out because I think that what's happening is the narrative doesn't fit in with the times anymore, for one. The principles are anachronistic, for one. For two, the, the principles in and of themselves are caricatures of the real world and the real life of people. I'm not a fucking caricature. Just like you don't want to be considered to be a mammy, a sapphire, or a Jezebel, I don't want to be the dumb black rapist jock nigga. Let me get back to it, man. I'm almost done with this, y'all. But we do not have the misguided notion that it is their maleness per se, that is their biological maleness, that makes them what they are. As black women, we find any type of biological determinism a particularly dangerous and reactionary basis upon which to build a politic. I agree with that shit, but it seems like that's not being taken into consideration at the current motherfucking moment now, is it? We also must question whether lesbian separatism is an adequate and progressive political analysis and strategy, even for those who practice it, since it so completely denies any but the sexual sources of women's oppression, negating the facts of class and race. I'm sorry I got worked into a fervor. I apologize. You know, the other day I I came across a friend of mine gave me information about a Facebook thread in where in which there were some women, you know, like I'm not trying to be little women in this conversation, but it's the assumptions that they make about us and the caricatures that they make about us and whether or not we're actually reading feminist philosophy or, 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 or politics or anything like like we're so fucking dumb and so troglodyte ish so fucking stupid, so country bumpkinish that we don't fucking have the, the innate capacity to understand, understand their concepts. And that we don't have any moral authority whatsoever to push back against anything that they say. That's dogmatism, man. That ain't fucking thinking and having a, a, an interchange and exchange of ideas. That's proselytization. That's zealotry.
That's a hegemonic discourse. But I look, at the end of the day, we're working our way through the Combahee River Collective Statement. And I think it's necessary because I think that the document is the precursor to intersectional feminism. And I think that some of the ideas which may or may not have been necessary at the time. I, I would suggest that some of them are, or rather were necessary at the time in which this document was drafted. I think maybe that they were necessary to some degree. I do take pause and issue with, you know, the caricatures of black men within the context or confines of the literature and the dismissiveness Oh, you're just some ugly bitches, so we don't want to hear what you smart, ugly bitches got to say. That's not how black men are. Like, we're superficial to an extreme. If they're not fuckable, then we don't want to hear anything you got to say. That we only operate on at the lower chakra level. Anyway, man, this is Green Gorilla Channel. I'm the G with a PhD. I want you all to be peaceful, stay blessed. I hope good fortune meets you. And until the next time, with the third installment, I'll holler at you. One.